Hello, dear audience. We are going to continue our conversation that we started last time about resentment. We all live through our resentments. We all get new resentments once we are done with the old ones. And we grow through this. And sometimes, like Dr. Fitzgerald mentioned, we can put our tenth there and live there with one we have. And we won't even have new ones. It will be so bad that we will live with the old one and we will become a stone like Lot's wife. Instead, we have to name it, we have to live, we have to examine it, we have to examine ourselves, the situation, and go on with our lives. I want to remind you again the story that I told from Raymond's uh, book that this woman who had not gone through her resentments had become lifeless like the chair in her office or she was looking out of the window into nothing, meaning that nothing existed anymore. She was dead. She had lost life. So resentment from this perspective is good because then we can continue our lives. We can deal with the situation, be done with it, and go on. But on the other hand, we have to be careful with it. Otherwise, we will forget that we are also sinful and maybe somebody else is resentful against us. I want to read one verse from the New Testament, from the Ephesians, where it says, And parents, never drive your children to resentment, but bring them up with correction and advice, inspired by the Lord. All of us, as we grow, we become teachers for the younger generation, or we leave the world as an inheritance for the others that are coming after us and they can be resentful against us. What kind of world did you leave for us? Or raising our children, we can make so many mistakes that later on in their life, for their failures in life, they will blame us. So resentment can work both ways. We can be resentful and we can also create resentment for others. Thank you, Presbytera, for being with us and giving a wonderful explanation for this reality in life in our last episode. And let's continue. I found several quotations about resentment in the New Testament and in the Bible in general. Most of them are trying to warn us from resentments and trying to show us that we are mortal beings, we are made of out of bones and flesh, and we shouldn't press on our resentments too hard because we are creating resentments in other people's lives. Thank you, Arkady. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I appreciate the many thoughts you just shared about resentment just now. and. Two thoughts that come to my mind immediately is resentments come out of our relationships and our relationships with our own selves, our relationship with one another, our relationship with God, our relationship with creation. Somehow, every time we feel resentment, we are caught in its snare. It occurs because something occurs with our relationships with human beings or with situations in life. So it's dynamic. It's always changing, growing, and taking us somewhere. And just by acknowledging that is a little wake-up call that we should kind of have a radar going at all times, sort of keeping tabs on as best as we can in a peaceful way, our own feelings, our own thoughts, where we are, and how we engage life and how life engages us and people in life engage us. The more we are peacefully aware of our own selves on many levels and our connections with others and with life, then when we find ourselves being resented by others or find ourselves feeling resentful, we have more data, so to speak, to help us with in our inquiry and how to respond. When you said, for example, earlier about a scriptural injunction to parents, do not provoke your children to resentment, that's been translated in several ways, but resentment is one way that that's expressed in English is very powerful because what is that kind of implying? Well, it's not implying regular parenting because good parents make mistakes, good parents sin, good parents flub up often, in fact. And there are parts of psychology that talk about good enough parenting. A parent just has to be good enough in order to be appropriate with their children, provide that safe enough context for them to grow into the persons God calls them to be. And so in psychology, that expression of good enough parenting, I love saying because it lets me off the hook as an adult who 
does not have her own children, but has many younger people in her life that I'm accountable to, and maybe an ally with their parents, to try to help as best as I humanly can as I make my mistakes. And so remembering that children even learn through our mistakes, how we apologize, how we make amends, how we model our working through our own failures. These are wonderful lessons that the children learn as we are broken, how we deal with the challenges that life brings us. And so with good enough parenting, with its ups and downs and failures and good things, that God still works through that, the good still works through that. What you're bringing up, however, in that scriptural passage is do not drive your children to resentment. That says a boatload of information. And part of that message is that by the time a child is driven to resentment, it's old news. A child is wired, so to speak, to desire a healthy relationship with a healthy mother and father and other adult figures in their lives. And so that's how the child is hardwired for. Children, we, we as children are hardwired for relationship so that we can grow from infancy through adulthood and then those relationships become the springboard for our adult lives later on. When we drive our children to resentment, it means we've been doing it for a long time it's a pattern that's gotten old for them because resentments don't occur unless it's really embedded, unless it's something you're just sick and tired because children get frozen there. And so uh, that's a wake up call to all of us who are living not very conscious in a not very conscious manner uh, with our own children and other people around us that how we live, how we engage, how we don't engage others has an impact in that relationship. Another thing I wanted to say about resentment is that when we feel resentment, it's very dangerous spiritually and psychologically. Why? Because when we set up camp, it's one thing when we feel it for a while and it might be part of the process. It's still not good. It still blocks love from coming in. But when we set up camp after a long time and, and live there and are too afraid to summon up the courage and reach out and go to the next stage, resentment becomes attached to malice. And malice completely blocks out the good, completely blocks out the love of God, completely cuts us off from authentic relationship with our own selves, with others, with God, because we're just continually engaging others from that place of malice and contempt. One of the contemporary leaders in marriage and marriage psychology Dr. John Gottman talks about contempt in relationship in terms of it being sulfuric acid to love. When we are at a place of contempt and malice is the source, it's a source of contempt, then we are taking like a, our own fire hose and instead of spewing that, to uh, put out a fire, we are spraying sulfuric acid out and inflaming things in a much worse way. When I had a lot of resentment, I noticed several times when I would share completely what has happened and very upset, I would feel very empty afterwards. At the time, I didn't even think about what's happening. I recognized it's something bad. I shouldn't be doing this. But now when I look back, that's what I recognize that even on a physical level, it was giving me a signal that you should be over this. It's poisonous to you. Yes. And one thing I would like to share with the audience, I have shared with many of my friends, that for me, getting out of that tent happened in a very subtle way. One night, I was just watching a movie about Charlie Chaplin, and he was in a situation where his art was not appreciated by the audience anymore. He was a clown, and people had been over it. They don't want to laugh anymore about these things. And in the result of this, he had been drawn out of the theater. But in his heart, that's where he belonged. And many times he attempted to go back and they kicked him out again because they were not making money off of him, so they didn't need him. And at one point he saved the life of this dancer who had been abandoned. He took her home, nursed her. She had lost balance. She couldn't walk anymore. And helped her to go back to her dance. And she became very popular became very good friends with the administration of the theater, and she tried to bring him back to the theater. And at one point, 
he said no, no, no many times. When she was pressing the issue that he has to go back, he used this expression. He said, no, I cannot go back. I have to go forward. Life is not about going back. If you keep going back in your life, you will end up nowhere. And I need to go forward. And he became a musician in a restaurant. And he had entertained so many people by his wonderful music that came from his suffering, from his love, from his jokes that he had in his heart, that he had become popular that way. And he came to the theater, not as a clown, but as a musician. And people adored him, loved him. And he showed that life is not about going back, it's not about even staying in one place, but constantly going forward. And that became enlightening for me, to live that tense. So this is a long story again, but it's, uh, it's helpful for myself and for people who may be sitting in a tent like that and wasting their life. It served its purpose. Whatever mm -hmm. that past issue was for Charlie Chaplin or for you or for me or other people, <laughs> It served its purpose. And we mentioned in the previous episode, as you mentioned, as you mentioned a little bit just now, Lot's wife from the Bible who turned to salt because she looked back. And the looking back, we are connecting with the issue of resentment or the longing for the good old bad days. That is one reason why, at least in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and especially in the Christian side of the line here, we are anxious about not becoming like Lot's wife. I said to you during the break, maybe she had already turned to stone on the inside before leaving mm -hmm. because she didn't listen to her husband. If she was beside him through the whole ordeal and knew that God was speaking to him, and she was still instead shutting down and looking back with longing at the good old times in Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah were not a place of love, and human kindness, to put it gently. She'd probably been mostly salt to begin with before the, the journey began, and that was sort of her last chance. Oh, here's your chance. Please don't look back, and she did. That's an unhealthy attachment to the past. To cut ourselves off from the past and be free-floating is to cut ourselves off from our roots because we believe as Christians that in Christ, everything, past, present, and future, are already one in Him, and we especially surrender to that reality of that ineffable, unable to explain phenomenon. I want to say miracle, but it's, it's what's already happened and is happening and will be fulfilled at the end of time, where at the uh, Eucharist, we as Orthodox believe and affirm that all of time, past, present, and future, are there at the anamnesis, at the remembrance, at the uh, solemn thanksgiving of the offering of, of the gifts uh, for communion with the Lord himself as the body, we as the body of Christ. And so to cut ourselves off from the past, paradoxically, cuts us off from the present and the future at the same time. So where's that balance? And so that's that healthy balance, that life-giving balance that leads us ever closer to one another, to creation, more authentic relationships with our own selves in the presence of God in growing communion with Him, all of us in Him. Resentment blocks that. Resentment, you know, pushes away from that. It's a dynamic that pushes away from that. But when we catch ourselves with resentment, I too, I too the great moi, have issues that have given me on several occasions, since I'm a little older than you, more than a little older than you, occasions for deep and profound resentment, to suffer the crucifixion of learning the lessons that are embedded in the depths of my resentment. And so what do I have to learn? What is the dream inside the depths of my resentment that was crushed or killed or perverted? It's a relationship. Sometimes the, the dream is a promise. Sometimes the dream is an expectation. I don't know. But there's many ways that can be experienced and understood. But the first question is, what is the dream in my resentment that I'm at odds with, that I cannot accept and I feel this way toward? The second thing is to examine what are the factors that led to this. And sometimes it's that we just do the first level of our resentment and don't go any deeper. And we really miss out on the lessons that are really waiting for us if we have the courage to enter more deeply into, okay, what is this about? What are the factors that I'm upset with outside of myself and within myself 
that are making me feel this way. It takes courage to enter more deeply into the sources of our resentment in the presence of God and faith and trust in God to help us through it. Because it's always new. It's always new. Every, every resentment I have is never the same. It might be the same old one in a new place. Mm -hmm. So it's never quite the same. Once I have a sense of the factors of the, that, that comprise the resentment, to individually deal with each of them as best as I can. And for sure, the last and not least is me. What's my part in this? Is it 50%? Is it 90%? Is it 1%? Whatever that part is. And then turn to God and give it to God and let God dissolve that. And what happens when that gets dissolved? I'm left naked. I was clothed for a while in the loss of the dream. I was clothed for a while in my self-righteous, oh, I've been robbed. And you know what? Keep those clothes on for a while. Sometimes we need those, especially as we're working through the grief. Keep those on. It's better when those clothes you know, evaporate on their own. But when we hold on to them, and we're really, you know, after a while holding on to threads or next to nothing, that's another story. And that's what we were saying earlier about staying in that foolish place, bad foolishness, of building a, a mansion in our resentments because we don't have the fe we don't have the courage to move on to the next place in our in our lives, and so when we are at that place in our healing, that the um, identification with the disappointment, with the crushing f feelings, are ready to be given to God, and to experience that nakedness. No one knows except God and you, <laughs> we've got clothes on, but it's a kind of nakedness that, thank you God, no one knows how vulnerable we are and how exposed we feel and how raw and undeveloped we feel as we proceed, especially with major disappointments in our lives, taking new steps, trusting Him, and allowing Him to refashion us in ways we had never been before. Somebody shared with me this story of talking to a person who had mental disorder and he was stuck with this idea of God being God of order, God of strict rules. And he said, when I tried to explain him that God is also compassionate, this person got very angry. And later on he says that he started thinking about this, that by giving him another idea of God, he was stripping him off what he had. And that made him angry because he would be left with nothing. He didn't want to let it go. That's one aspect of it. Another thing, Jewish people still have the tradition of reading the story of Exodus every year on the day of Pascha. And one explanation that I heard, it's not the historical Exodus that they are talking about. They are talking about the Exodus of every person in their life. Where are they stuck? Is this Egypt holding them back from their new life or they have to leave the old and go to the new place. But one thing that happens in everyone's life, according to this story, that is something that happened to the Jews when they were exiting Egypt. As we recall in the story, they are suffering in Egypt and they are basically slaves to this nation. And when Moses finally gets the permission to get them out of the Egypt, they resent, they don't want to go out. They don't want to leave Egypt, first of all, because they have something in Egypt. And second is that the direction that they are going is to a desert where it's dark, it's cold, it's empty, there is nothing. It's yes. familiar and comfortable. Even if it's uncomfortable, it's familiar and that's comfort. So in, in our resentment, I think that's one of the powers that holds us back, keeps us in, in that tent. We still have a tent, you know, it's not raining on our heads, but we get out, get out of the tent so many things can happen. Do you think that somebody who has a lot of resentments, besides taking off that dirty clothes that they have on, they don't also want to recognize who they are underneath the clothes? It's not trusting the God of love in our lives. Because sure, we have our brokenness, we have our sins, our sinfulness. And still not trusting that God is bigger than all that. And that the good He's also given us that's inside us that maybe we are disconnected from as a result of our brokenness or our sinfulness is still there waiting to be better appreciated and connected with and empowered by the love of God because we've lacked the courage to slowly re-examine our whole life. That might be the deeper work we have to do 
that feeds our little immature resentments. Repentance is that phenomenon of changing of mind and heart where there is a complete change going from changing not just from left to right, but kind of going from a banana to an apple. It is that radical a change where one's mind and heart and orientation in life completely change. And it's an ongoing discipline of growth and cultivating. And God does really most of the work. We just do the most we can on our side of the line, meaning our actions and thoughts and heart. And then he winds up changing us in ways we don't understand. St. John Climacus writes on this, repentance is the renewal of baptism and is contact with God for a fresh start in life. Repentance goes shopping for humility and is ever distrustful of bodily comfort. Repentance is critical awareness and a sure watch over oneself. Repentance is the daughter of hope and the refusal of despair. Repentance is reconciliation with the Lord for the performance of good deeds which are the opposite of sin. And he wrote this in the fifth century. Pretty contemporary sounding to me. <laughs> Sometimes our resentments can be blocking our view. Our resentments can also color our reality. When we look at our resentments, to start examining what kind of picture is that painting about ourselves? I think I started to say this earlier. What kind of picture is it painting of our own orientation and our own priorities? I think this is really, sometimes when we think we're doing well, and I, you know, sometimes I can go there. And my, my self-righteousness starts getting higher to the point where I notice it. When I notice my self-righteousness is getting high, then I know I've way passed the line. And so I need to ask myself, where am I being proud in a way that's imbalanced, that's taking my attention away from authentic life and instead pointing it toward all about me? And, and that's, I think, an invitation for all of us to be undertaking because that is true self-knowledge, knowing who we are in the presence of God as best as we humanly can a minute at a time. There's two quotes I want to share, and I've mm -hmm. shared this in the past, but it's been at least a year. This is one of my favorite quotes from St. Gregory of Nyssa, who lived in the fourth century, and he talks about self-knowledge being really very important as opposed to unexamined life where we are led by our immaturities and our delusions of grandeur, as we've talked about in the past, which are fired on by our resentments and the malice that comes from that. And St. Gregory says this, he says, our greatest protection is self-knowledge and the avoidance of the delusion that we are seeing ourselves when we are really looking at something else. This is what happens to those who do not examine themselves. What they see is strength, beauty, reputation, political power, great wealth, pomp, self-importance, bodily stature, and they think that this is what they are. Such persons make very poor guardians of themselves. Because of their absorption in something else, they overlook what is their own and leave it unguarded. How can a person protect what he does not know? The most secure protection for our treasure is to know ourselves. Each one of us must know himself as he is so that he may not be unconsciously protecting something else other than himself. And there's another quote, a contemporary of St. Gregory's, Basil the Great, who lived also in the fourth century, and he reflects on the Lord's teachings and teaching us to abstain from evil thoughts, evil actions, which are fueled by our resentments. And he, and he says this, do not cure evil by evil, nor strive to outdo one another in inflicting injuries. For in such evil strife, he who wins is more to be pitied, for he goes away bearing the greater part of the blame. Do not pile up the debt of your own wickedness. Do not make an evil debt more evil. Does someone in rage insult you? Bear with the offense in silence. Instead, you gather your heart the evil food of his wrath. You imitate the winds that throw back whatever is thrown against them. Do not let your enemy become your teacher, and do not strive to become what you detest. Beware, lest you become the mirror of an angry person reflecting his image in yourself. It always is contemporary. I keep going back to looking at our priorities through our resentments. Sometimes we can do it by looking at what's important to us, 
in our positive, and usually we talk about the positive parts of the human person and the gifts and to appreciate the gifts. But every now and then we can get a lot out of looking at what our dark motivations and pains, where are they coming from? Once we get to hang a little bit of doing that, because that's a discipline of listening and paying attention and trying to respond and asking God for help, then we might need to look at other priorities that are being thrown at us, that are being conveyed through our relationships with other people, the culture in which we find ourselves, and the society through in which we live that makes its way to our attention, telling us what is real and what is not real, telling us what's important and what's not important. Because I would guess that a big chunk for most of us within the sound of our voices have been influenced by the media, have been influenced by the society around us in what is healthy, what is good, what is successful, what is not successful. And to pay more attention to those messages of what is right and good that may or may not be serving the author of life. Right now, we are still in November, and I can't escape Christmas music. <laughs> and much of the Christmas music, which was a little joke from God, much of the Christmas mu music I've been hearing uh, for the past month have been the chintzy, very light, jingle belly, and I love jingle bells most of the time. I used to love it a lot. Now I'm getting anesthetized to it, because I know, I can tell that through the media, I am being like, like cattle, sort of driven toward a certain direction, which is to the marketplace, to start spending, you know, and we are being what predators do to their victims. They groom their victims. And even before they get the payoff of what, however they, especially sexual predators, even before they get the payoff of violating the person they have as their target, the predator already is high, so to speak, just through this, getting the canvas ready and finding the right victim and grooming the victim. This is all enticing and exciting and sadly for the uh, perpetrator, the addict, who goes from one dimension of illness to another through their getting off on this as they groom the innocent victim, the victim that has no clue that they're being groomed and sort of directed in the direction they want to go. I feel like that from July when I am doing channel surfing on occasion at two in the morning because I can't sleep. And I can tell that they want my Christmas dollars in July, in August, in September. And so when the Christmas music starts in October, I start getting resentful and I need to look at that. Some of it might be righteous, uh, but some of that is a waste of my time. To the point where I had to bite my tongue the past couple of days telling people I'm sick of Christmas music because maybe for them they're just starting to hear it. I might be a little bit oversensitive right now and so I'm glad I bit my tongue. Why? Because as I'm driving up here and I turn the radio on, the first thing I hear are some of those beautiful Christmas hymns with the music, with beautiful voices that disarmed me completely and I said, oh, but to be more aware of how we're being played. And so, but what was very sweet about that episode is I was coming up a little self-righteous about, oh, this culture, oh, this marketing, all this, and it's all true. But at the same time, do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There might be tons, tons, gallons, tons of bathwater, which makes it harder to catch the baby, but to catch the baby. And to be more mindful of what we are being sold through the society around us so that we can catch the baby as we try to get out of the way of the bathwater. It's interesting, working in a retail business, eight hours a day, I just listened to that music, which is meant specifically for consumers to get into that bus and go to the marketplace. <laughs> I enjoy Christmas music because it comes right after the Halloween music. Somebody once told me that after five or six years of seeing the Christmas colors, I'll be tired of it. Because it comes in a contrast of Halloween, I always enjoy it. I have never gotten tired of it yet. People are at least happy instead of bringing their newborn babies to show some screaming character, which I never understood why a mother would bring their child to the store and show them a crying, headless creature. I'm glad you're saying that, Arkady. I appreciate that. That's, that, that's, that's my reason. I'm, incredu <laughs> I, I'm incredulous. I, still, I, I haven't even gotten to resentment yet. I'm still like in shock when I see that. 
I'm not resentful yet because I'm incredulous. It's just like, how can they? And so, but I don't want to get overly judgmental because by getting judgmental, I waste energy. And when we judge, that's, again, we said earlier in the previous episode, name the sin, to deny it is to feed it. Mm -hmm. To obsess about it is to feed it. So to name it fully. To name it fully, and I'll add one more thing, and not to judge. Mm -hmm. Because when we judge, like you said the mother, I can't judge that mother. I'm disturbed very much by that phenomenon. I've, at the same time, there's no way for me to judge that mother or father it would be playing God. I would be defining them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if tomorrow morning that mother or father will say, hey, what are we doing? You know, what am I doing to my baby? What, what am I doing? Coming to their senses. And I still stay with my judgment if I have been judging. Exactly, before. exactly. And, and the Bible is filled with stories of people who came to their senses as a result of encountering the therapeutic love of God. So to name it, it's a really razor's edge discipline that we will make mistakes on, but that's the discipline of naming it, not ignoring it, not obsessing, and when we name it fully, not to judge the person. You know, the person may be guilty of X, Y, and Z, absolutely. That does not necessarily mean we define them by judging them to be of X, Y, and Z. In the resentment, there is also the portion of judging. And Christ says, do not judge, because you will be judged. In the meantime, we are frozen in the judgment. When we are frozen, it's kind of like the sin of familiarity that we've talked about. If I, quote, know you, I define you. And so you or anybody else are less than me in my judgment. And so when I do that, I feel kind of haughty and superior, but I don't realize, because it doesn't hurt, because it's based on my self-righteousness, that, oh, I'm frozen too. And in my relationship with this person, I'm frozen. But whatever is that package that makes me come to these assumptions, how I'm frozen also is used in the rest of my life where I will be missing out on opportunities and relationships and good things and maybe avoiding certain traps and problems because I have not repented, I've not changed how I do things because quite frankly, I have too many secondary gains coming from this for right now, thank you very much, mm -hmm. and don't have the time, courage, or desire to move on and become a better person. In Job's book, we read this sentence, resentment kills the senseless, and anger brings death to the fool. Talking about the judgment or resentment or a sin not hurting, I was thinking about this. The end result is that it's going to kill us, but it kills us without hurting. In class we talked about this the other day a little bit because I remember sharing with the class about how we are psychosomatic unities. To be a human being means to be a body and a soul, or body and soul and spirit. Physical and non-physical, at least from our side of things, how it is to be human. We need both. I talked about uh, in the class of how someone could get the chills and you could be dealing with truth. And after I said that to the class two weeks ago, a few days after that, I was watching someone selling something on the television. Because of the, the discount or the beauty of it, she said, oh, I have truth bumps as a result of this whatever. And I'm thinking, you're getting truth bumps and you're talking about this on national television over an object that you're trying to sell as because it's on special or because it's pretty or what have you. What is your truth? And then I realized, where your heart is, there your treasure is also. So of course she's going to get truth bumps if her heart is, God bless her, I'm not trying to judge, but let's say theoretically, aimed at the material only or mostly as God, or whatever Madison Avenue or the marketer say is real, that she's bought that fake God, you know. And so, okay, she's getting truth bumps according to the gospel, the bad gospel of the fake God. The more we sensitize ourselves to the truth of the loving God, our truth bumps hopefully will reflect more authentic reality, not just objectives of a lesser God. Quoting this from Job, I had an image of painless death. The scene or resentment is that kind of anesthetic that makes us senseless, like he says here. It kills the senseless. It means that because we are senseless, we don't feel what the scene does to us. But from the flip side of it, we are senseless because we have so many sins. At the end of your explanation, you mentioned that we have to become more sensitive 
We don't get rid of the sin. God does the healing, mm -hmm. but to acknowledge them and ask for forgiveness and to turn to God for help and trust in the love of God, which God delights in helping us. It, there's nothing, nothing, nothing that God won't forgive. There's nothing, nothing, nothing God won't heal from the inside out. Does that mean if someone has a physical illness that that will be healed or something has happened physically, a physical malady? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I don't know, according to God's love, what he has in store for each of us. At the same time, it's the, this discipline, this listening. A discipline is a listening of turning our whole being in the direction of the loving God and trusting Him. We have to remember that when we stay too long in our resentments, and we need them. They become teachers, as I said, but when we build those tents, you reminded me of St. Gregory of Nautic, 10th century, uh, teaching that you become what you look at. The scriptures and many writers through the centuries have talked and warned us that when we look with our spiritual mind's eye at something for too long, we tend to become more attracted and become more like that which we look at or we, we turn our gaze to, we, we, we invest our attention in. This is a teaching that goes back to many of the ancient Christian writers, but the instruction is more turn to God face God, name the sin, and then turn to God, to the good, so that this is what we become more sensitized to. While we are real, while we are being real to what we're seeing around us, that the bottom line is they do not define reality. It is God's love through which reality is defined. Sometimes when we judge other people, it's because we see ourselves in them. And that's what happens when we obsess too much about our enemy. What St. Bates was just saying earlier, beware lest you become the mirror of an angry person reflecting his image in yourself. Do not let your enemy become your teacher and do not strive to become what you detest. I want to conclude this conversation with this quote. God is tenderness, slow to anger and rich in faithful love. His indignation does not last forever, nor his resentment remain for all time. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor repay us as befits our offenses. First thing I would like to mention is that God has resentments too. I would love to see what the Septuagint Greek says, as well as the original Hebrew. But when I think of resentment from that perspective, I think of remembering wrongs. And so if resentment is the action of remembering wrongs, which from the human side, is the case, and we kind of have those nasty, malevolent feelings that come with that. God doesn't have malevolent feelings, but God does remember wrongs. And so that phrase from the Psalms reminds us that God's heart toward us is always tender, that He loves His creation. When you read the scriptures and you read the witness through the centuries of holy people, that over and over again they affirm pretty much the same thing, that God had each one of us in mind from before the establishment of creation. And that's just a, a mind-blowing kind of concept to think that he couldn't wait for each of us to be born. And so if this is how he feels toward each one of us in ways that we don't understand, of course he's not going to be ruled by the remembering the wrong in the human understanding of the word. He's going to be present with us to help us grow closer to him and lead us closer to him. And the last sentence here says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve. I want to connect this with the Lord's Prayer where it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. His forgiveness is not based on our sins, but it is based on how we forgive others. We have to be careful. When we talk in terms of God not forgiving us because we have not forgiven others, it's not as if he's being like us, childish, manipulative, withholding, punitive. Even when the scriptures refer to God's punishment and we use human-based words, it's because we're using human-based words to talk about something beyond us and these are the best words that we can find. Remember, forgiveness is a process. And then the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, as we forgive those who sin against us. And the as in Greek, as we said before in this program, in the original Greek of the Lord's Prayer, is the little word os, omega s, and sigma. 
which is even stronger. It is the word as in English, but it's a much more dynamic, it's a very powerful little word, which says it's a real process mm -hmm. and it's a real effort. And a lot of the time, maybe not all the time, but a lot of the time for certain types of uh, issues that require us to forgive. And so, and God knows this. And so I think paradoxically, God wants us to be in that process of growing in forgiveness of others, even our own selves, in His presence. And that's what He's looking for. Because that process points to an eternal process. Mm -hmm. And God is an eternal God. So we can say that we're asking God's forgiveness for the attempt, for the effort that we put on for forgiving others. Absolutely, ongoing effort. And sometimes the ongoing effort is to name the sin. Mm -hmm. For a while, sometimes if people have been oppressed and they've been denied the opportunity to even have a sense of their own humanity or that they've been wronged or, no, you have no right to want this. It might take a while for them to even move past that first stage of, which is an important first stage of saying, I am and I hurt and I've been hurt. And that paradoxically is the first stage of that process. And then the second stage might be more like, and who are you? And how come this happened? And how do I release you? in a more authentic way so that I'm released in a more authentic way in the presence of God. So I'm actually more at peace with this right now because God just wants us to keep striving. Just God wants us to keep gently but honestly pushing forward and growing in the direction of healing, which means first ourselves and the relationships which cause the rupture mm -hmm. to begin with. Thank you, Presbytera. I want to also remember that we are going towards Christmas and the mystery of Christmas is God being born among us. And I remember from the New Testament where Christ says that the Good Shepherd leaves 99 sheep and goes looking for the one who was lost. And that Shepherd puts himself in danger sometimes. Being raised in a village, I know what the shepherds do. I have endangered myself several times for a little goat that belonged to somebody I didn't want to lose. And in the spirit of Christmas, we have to come to understand, I think, that Christ endangered Himself to be born into a flesh, meaning that God became like us, so that we have the hope and we don't despair, we don't lose our connection with God. However big our resentments are, they will be over one day and we will find love and hope. Thank you very much.